Heiger, Heiger, Heiger. <laughs> hey, Grace Steel Nation, Sully here with the Barbell Prescription, keeping you strong and healthy in the second half of life. And comfy, too. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, I could explain it simply, but I don't want to. Instead, we're going to start by going back to medieval times. The 8th, 9th, and 10th centuries in Europe were no fun at all. This gruesome era is in that hazy, ill-defined intersection between the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages. Rome, dead since about 476 and still dead, had somehow failed to restore order, sanitation, or the internet. Starbucks was still more than a few centuries off, disease was rampant, and big government was not even a thing meaning the quality and security of your life situation depended to a great extent on the temperament, competence, and relative brutality of your friendly local warlord. Also, lavatories did not flush, and the toilet paper situation circa 900 AD was even worse than it was in the beginning of the COVID pandemic, to the extent that that even seems possible. Really, as much as it sucked, 2020 looks positively bountiful in comparison to the 9th century. And then there were the Vikings. These were not nice people. They came from Scandinavia, which is now full of nice people. But in those days, they were just jerks, and smelly jerks at that. Their long, shallow draft boats and their heavy swords ravaged Europe for centuries. Vikings pirated and robbed and looted for plunder and trade, sure, but no big deal. That's just the wholesome, unregulated market. Good old capitalism, because freedom. But the Vikings did not satisfy themselves with respectable predatory economic activity. They also burned, raped, defiled, and murdered because, well, because they liked it. The Danes and their Norwegian and Swedish buddies made the early Middle Ages a serious bummer. Then, all of a sudden, they stopped. Why? Herge. Herge. For those of you who've been living under a rock or actually practicing an extreme form of herga, is a Danish word of uncertain etymology that means more or less cozy and warm and not at all Viking-like in disposition. It's what Norse Vikings called koshelig and Swedish Vikings called mishtig and samurai, Japanese Vikings, might call matari. It's an approach to making life more comfy and agreeable particularly life in the winter, which in Scandinavia lasts for about 17 or 18 months every year. In short, the Viking Age came to a close not because of the superior military might of the Franks or the consolidation of power of the crown in the nascent nation states or the civilizing impulse of Christianity, but because of snuggly pillows, nice scarves, and hot cocoa. The Vikings got cozy, so their mood improved, and poof, the Dark Ages were over. That is an actual historical fact. Now, everybody knows that modern Denmark is an oppressive, failed, dystopian, socialist nightmare state. But the Danes themselves don't seem to notice because of Herge, or Herge, or however you pronounce it. Herge. 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 So, while they clearly have nothing much to teach us about healthcare, civil rights, education, labor, or economic policy, they have learned how to deal with the second most horrible winters on the planet. Michigan, baby, we're still number one. Thus, as we continue to slog through what promises to be a particularly dreary, dark, and uncertain winter, a winter in the ninth century style, we who are athletes of aging might do well to think about the Hugga lifestyle at least to the extent that it can keep the bitterness of the season out of our training and suppress the impulse to go all Norsemen on our significant others. You'll find no shortage of videos, books, and blogs about Hugga. Many appear to be devoted in large part to the pronunciation of the word, which I don't believe even most Danes have mastered. But interwoven with the North Germanic phonetics tutorials, you'll find an abundance of specific recommendations for embracing the way of Hugga. And what you'll find after digesting a bunch of this stuff is that there is no such thing as the way of Hugga. No Hugga system and no right Hugga. 
Herge is about you being warm and cozy and content with your mind and body in a state of healthy and restful poise. So, much like an intermediate training program, it will become more tightly individualized as you grow into it and increase your coziness gains. That all being said, there are some common themes. First of all, Herge aims to indulge all the senses. Now, winter can be an ordeal of sensory deprivation. Everything is gray and somber and colorless, activity levels fall, and warmth and fragrance seem a million miles away. Herge responds with scented candles, warm pillows and throws, delicious aromatic teas and other hot drinks, pleasing seasonal decorations, and warm hearty meals. We indulge in flavored coffee drinks, steaming hot casseroles and soups and stews, and time spent talking or reading in front of a roaring fireplace, if we're lucky enough to have one. Indulgence is perhaps a problematic word in this context. On the one hand, herga is an indulgence of our senses to keep them alive and sated. On the other hand, it's not indulgence at all because it's also about not sinking into despondency or butchering our family and friends at a time of year when the cold and the slush and the ice on the windshield can turn anybody into a pathetic, misunderstood, seasonally depressed, sword-wielding, helmeted marauder. Second, Herga embraces seasonal activities. This means that Herga looks at winter the way you look at a set of deadlifts. Not something to be avoided or even endured, but something to be lived and even relished. Herga is not about wrapping yourself in a cardigan with a 12-gallon tumbler of cocoa and not going outside for four months. Yes, you make your indoor environment warm and inviting to the senses, but that comfort is even more inviting after you've ventured out into the world. So, to my way of thinking, Herga is all about the ritual of suiting up for a walk in the snow with a dog or a loved one, appreciating the jagged yet beautiful contours of the leafless trees and snow-dusted needles of the conifers, feeling the stark and strangely delicious contrast of the cold on your cheeks and the warmth on your properly shod feet and gloved hands, the crunch of snow under your heels, the sharp clean smell of winter air, and the delicious finishing ritual of coming back inside, shedding the winter gear and putting it away carefully and turning on the tea kettle or brewing the coffee. It's a kind of training. If you make it a habit to go outside in winter on all but the bitterest days with an attendant going out and coming in ritual, all part of a recreation or active rest, you start to break down the idea that going out in the winter is a noxious chore. For me, this approach makes it seem a little less oppressive when I really do have to go out. And by now, it should be clear that simplicity, a return to fundamentals, a sort of Viking Zen appreciation of here and now, and a certain Norse stalwartness are at the core of whatever a herder really is. It should also be clear that properly pursued, it is a concept that is entirely consonant with the lifestyle of the athlete of aging exerting its agreeable effects on the crucial fulcrum of recovery. Herga keeps active rest, sleep, and nutrition in context during a season that can drain us of our recovery capacity. I encourage you to explore the myriad resources on the concept at your fingertips via the magic of the Google. But don't spend so much time surfing about Herga that you don't actually do Herga. Turn off the tube, go for a walk in the woods, come back inside, Put on a winter playlist, light a fire, grab that book you've been meaning to read, and snuggle up with a loved one in a cup of something delicious and hot. There. You just became a Herga master. And you didn't even have to live through the dark ages to do it. Keep watching. We've got more great content on aging strong and healthy coming right at you.